next week, the week after, and the other week after. We have some very wonderful honeymoon packages to give out. Can I hear? Yay! I know you're doing that. Honeymoon packages. Um, somewhere around August, our um, single summit, Becoming Mr. and Mrs., will happen. But this year also we have, we're going to be focusing on people who are planning to get married. Because we have established on this show several times that most of the issues that happen in marriages are because we don't discuss them well enough before we plunge into the marriage. So Becoming Mr. and Mrs. will be coming off in August. We will keep you updated when we're getting there. But this week, next week, the week after, and the one that follows, we have honeymoon packages. Guess where we're taking you? So here's the deal. If you have a friend who is getting married next Saturday, or you know somebody, the person could be your family member, a friend, a loved one, just somebody that you think deserves this, right? What you have to do is, and make sure that they are ardent listeners of Home Affairs, okay? We want, this is also a reward for our very, you know, um, special listeners. You don't have to send in the message if you are getting married. Somebody will have to do that on your behalf, okay? So you just drop us a message, your name, the name of the person getting married could be the name of the man or the woman and then add your contact to it. We will contact you and do the rest of all the skirmishes with you. We've done this before. So next week, we will send their package to them whilst they are preparing to surprise them. They, maybe they have booked their honeymoon already. It's fine. But this is another one that we are giving them. Like I said, guess where we are taking them to? Lou Moon. Yes, if you have ever heard of Lou Moon... That's where we are taking um, our friends who are getting married between now and the next four weeks too. So start looking through your, you know, your contact, your phone and find out who is getting married, especially next week. And then send the details to us. We will contact you and do all the underground work. And then Saturday morning, I mean, we would like to deliver this especially to the lady while she's, you know, preparing and everything she gets, you know, um, a dispatch rider arrives at their door and then, you know, this whole package and other things are delivered to them. So that's the good news I have for you. You want to make somebody happy. You want to surprise them. They could go on their honeymoon and come back. This will wait for them. I mean, any day they choose, any weekend they choose within the year, they will be able to, you know, use it. So that's the good news that we have for you. But now let's get into our conversation. Is it, is it illegal to start dating after a separation? How do I take custody of my kids in a divorce situation? Who is entitled to a limony after a divorce? And these and other legal questions on marriage is what we are doing on Home Affairs this morning. And we're glad to have lawyer Kukuya Mwapinsel, who is a lawyer, family life counselor, and a reverend minister handling this for us. He has done it excellently over the period and that's why we keep going back to him so lawyer once again you're welcome and we are on to the conversation now. thank you great so is it illegal to start dating after a separation you know <coughs> separation as we know it generally which is the putting away of a husband and a wife during the course of a marriage it's not recognized under our laws in Ghana. Mm. So whenever you talk of separation, mm. under our laws of marriage and divorce, living apart for a minimum of two years provides a ground for divorce in Ghana if both parties consent to it. That would have concerned the other. But if you live apart for five years, that to say if you live apart for five years, then either party can go to court and automatically seek a divorce on the basis of separation. So separation in the context of a marriage is not recognized in Ghana. In other words, you can't, as a result of some disaffection or some differences mm -hmm. between husband and wife, go mm -hmm. to court and legally re require the court to separate you, mm. which is a legal phenomenon in other jurisdictions. But in Ghana, it is not part of our law. 
separation is only recognized within the context of a divorce when like i said the parties have lived two years apart with the consent of the other you can seek a divorce or if they've lived five years apart then automatically either party can go to court and seek for a divorce on the basis of that separation i see this is interesting yes so <laughs> <laughs> and so for the many times that I mean uh you know counseling in 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 Ghana here largely yeah. is done by if you are a Christian then it is usually done by the church. Yes. A few people will go out of their way to engage other professionals to counsel them in different areas before they get married. But yes. most of the churches will recommend three to four months of counseling. Yes. And so when it comes to keeping the marriage together, largely it depends on the church and the counselors because when you have issues, most of the time they are taken back to the, the church counselors to do post-marital counseling. Yes. And I have, I know of a number of them, I'm sure Leah Pencil, you know too, about sometimes the counselors asking the couple to stay apart for a while so that everybody can breathe and then make the decisions and come back. So what we are saying is that that decision that usually um, church counselors will make mar married couples take is illegal. I wouldn't say it's illegal, but it cannot form a basis for seeking a relief in court. No, we're not even talking about a relief in court. I want us to talk about the bit about the no, separation. No, no, no. It's practical common sense car. It's practical is common sense car. It helps the parties to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good use that... But that it does not have a place in law. It does not have... In other words, unlike other jurisdictions... Let me explain it this way. In <laughs> other jurisdictions, the court can legally separate the parties. In other words, you can go to court and request for a separation order and the order will be made on terms that you you have to live apart for this number of years and these are the provisions in terms of maintenance in terms of child custody and, and that all is not divorce that. and that's not divorce that's separation but that's recognized by law in other words a court a judge can sit in court and make those orders but even in those situations mm -hmm. the parties have to caution themselves because if even you are separated by an order of court, there are many things you cannot do. Uh -huh. There are many <laughs> things you cannot do. Because the separation itself is within the context of a marriage. Yes. Recognized by law. So, for instance, within the context of that separation, you cannot have an affair, adultery, mm -hmm. with other parties. Because once you do it, it will precipitate the dissolution. I mean, that's even by law. But I'm saying that our laws in Ghana do not recognize separation within the context of a marriage. The only context in which separation is recognized is for purposes of seeking a dissolution of the marriage. And so if you have lived apart, however, whatever the terms on the which you lived apart, if you lived apart for two years, then you require the consent of the other party to, I mean, to have the court dissolve the marriage. But if the parties have lived apart for five years or more, then either one can just go into the court and ask that the marriage be dissolved on the basis of living apart. That's the separation for five years. That's a fiscal separation. It wasn't by a court order. So that's the distinction. Mm. Separation by a court order exists in other jurisdictions, but not in Ghana. So you can't go to court and say, but for this reason, A, B, and C, we want an order of the court for us to live apart and for the man to perform these other functions. I say the man because it's always the man. But <laughs> let me put <laughs> oh, <laughs> or, for the, so. or for the other spouse to do this and to do that. In Ghana, you can't do that. The only, day, uh, the only time that you can come to court mm -hmm. and rely on the physical act of living apart, which is a separation, is within the context mm -hmm. of a divorce proper before a court of law. Okay, but you mentioned earlier that um, a judge can also, I mean, um, in, like institute a separation, right? Mm -hmm. Especially so if it is maybe, I mean, I know there are, times where they will ask you to go and you know see if you can work things out and it's not like you go to court and then they are granting your divorce so in that case even mm -hmm. if it is granted by a judge 
um, for the purposes of healing or, you know, all of those things. What, how long can that be? <laughs> well, let me, let me clarify that point. Um, the only ground for dissolving a marriage in Ghana is that the marriage has broken down beyond anything. In other words, uh, nothing can be done about Irreparable. it. Irreparable. That is so. But then what it means in practical effect is that any time that a judge has got any reason, mm -hmm. any suggestion mm -hmm. to show that the parties can be reconciled, mm -hmm. it is the duty, it's actually provided by the rules, the duty of the judge to ask the parties to go and endeavor to settle their differences mm -hmm. with or without whatever help. I mean, and that is not legal separation in the sense of the law. In other words, the request by a judge to parties to go and resolve their differences with the help of whoever, it's not separation. Mm -hmm. It's not the separation. I, I understand Even that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The proper separation is the judge making an order yeah. that go and live apart for reasons A, B, B C, D. and for those reasons, either the man or the woman must do this and do that and provide this. Now, in this in this instance, yes. if the, the judge issues such an order, yes, how long can it be for? The, there's no time limit. In ah, so it can go for as long as five years? It could be more, even more. And that is not a divorce situation? It's not. So for as long as that order has been given, for whatever reason, uh -huh. you are not allowed to be seeing another person. No, no, no. It's not the guy who asks you to <laughs> not to do this or not to do that. Common sense dictates. In other words, you are still within the marriage. So you can't do it. That's what I just want us to establish. No, you can't do it like the law places a ban on you. But no, common but, sense dictates. But, but you're still married to the person. That's the point I'm so making. So the law even places a, a, an injunction I'm on you, I'm just talking it? about this in the context of what husbands and wives do, whether a judge has spoken or has not spoken. So effectively, I recognize the point that you're making. Mm -hmm. But the real point that I want, to, I want to establish is that anything short of the separation by a court of law is still marriage. Okay. In other words, the judge need not even educate you. The judge need not tell you anything. Exactly. Because you are still within the context of a marriage. And what it means, for instance, is that, of course, if you go away from the court and you do anything else which aggravates the existing situation, that will rather stampede the, the dissolution of the marriage. Mm -hmm. That's the way I will put it. Uh, Prince, so just clarify this for me simply. If you are not divorced, mm -hmm. like properly, properly divorced, yes. and it is even an issue of a court separation or a court order for you to be separated for whatever reason, you can't be dating anybody no. else. You can't. No. Okay. So that's the point. Dating I, is divorce. Uh, dating is adultery. Now, let me uh, That will aggravate this. the situation. Because adultery is a specific ground for dissolution of a marriage. Okay. How about the situation where you have started the divorce process and everybody knows that this is going to end in a divorce, but then it's a process and you haven't completed the process. <laughs> and you, you, you look around and you find somebody you're <laughs> interested in. Can you start seeing that person pending the divorce? The answer is no. <laughs> In other words, whatever you do aggravates an already existing situation. Oh, no. The situation there is leading to divorce already. That is so. I know. But like I'm saying, uh, good, good, good sense will not encourage you to do that. I know in practical, practical people do I a do lot of exactly. things. But you, we are talking of it within the context of law. Even from the Christian perspective, mm. it's still not good because in respect of the fact that the marriage has not been dissolved, whatever you do is adultery, even from Christian perspective. It does not matter. So that is what I would say both in the context of the law and even the context of religion. Okay, so I am asking these questions because, like I said, someone sent us a mail. Yes. Right? And in that mail, she said they had been separated. Yes. I am not sure now whether it is the court that ordered them to be separated. But they have been separated for like five years. Yes. They don't live together. Yes. However, they are not divorced. Yes. And after five years, 
Um, she doesn't see them coming back together. She's seen some. She's met somebody, and they have formed a good relationship. And you know, they are they are, they are dating. You're right. It's just that I mean, you can't come out with it. And her concern is to find out if um, could that if ever the husband finds out or the man finds out that. She is seeing somebody. Could that be a grounds for her losing what she's entitled to, even during the divorce? Because she knows that this thing is going to end in a divorce anyway. But could that be a grounds for her losing her entitlements, like maybe her, her part of the property and all that, um, if eventually the divorce goes through? No, it cannot be, and it I will explain. Be. The real danger she faces is mm. if she were to die today, whatever properties that she's got, would descend in order of inheritance and other stuff like that to the husband mm. who is on record as a husband. Mm. That's the real danger that a lot of these couples they face, which mm. is the, the marriage is practically dissolved, if I may put it that way, mm. though the, the, the law holds it intact. Yeah. The real danger these people run is if any one of them were to die, then all the rules of testacy and intestacy will begin to apply. The law will not recognize the fact that they had living Issues. even with that new man or the new woman. The law does not recognize that. The law has personally been involved in this kind of things in court and mm. in church mm. and wherever. Mm. And all that the husband or the wife has to do is to go to court for instance to apply for letter administration to govern your estate. Mm. And that would be it. I mean, irrespective of the fact that you are living with another man, another woman, to the knowledge of the whole world, the law doesn't recognize those re those relationships. I mean, especially if it's an ordinance marriage, mm. because you know, in the in the context of cosmic marriage, people can fabricate all kind of things like, I mean, whatever yeah. that they had dissolved. But in ordinance, marriage, an ordinance marriage right. can only be dissolved by a court of law. Mm. So when you are living an ordinance marriage and the court of law has not made a pronouncement, then your law is for all purposes, to all intents and everything, recognized by the law as being in existence. So that's mm -hmm. the real danger. But like the other situations that you talked about that you are living in, people do it and we know it. Yeah. And f of course, in the eyes of the law, you cannot lose any benefit that you are entitled to in the law, except that our laws on dissolution of marriage is essentially fault finding. In other words, e every dissolution of marriage has to end up on one person's petition or the, cro uh, uh, the counter petition, or the cross petition, which means that the court will find and that will only count in terms of damages that the court would award. Don't forget that any time that you go to court, the court wants to find out who's conduct has necessitated this unfortunate end mm. and the court will express its is 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 appreciation or lack of it in terms of the award of legal costs mm. but to not affect your substantive rights okay. like property rights and all of that to not affect it at all okay great yes. now the following um a follow up to this so in another situation where um We've spoken about prenups and things here in the studio <laughs> before. But this is not a prenup situation. You're married to somebody, right? Um, in the course of the marriage, you but acquired... But prenups don't work in Ghana, so I know. go on. So, so you acquired properties. Yes. And you know at the time where the love is at the peak of it, you are... And so you probably are doing the documentations, and then you tell the man that, you know what, you are the man... Um, you know, a typical um, submissive wife. Lead and let me follow. So because you are the man and the husband, you can use your name on all the properties and all that. It's fine. Like, I am your wife and I respect your leadership. So that is done on love and affection and respect, which happens a lot. And then some way, somehow, this man, because you, you, pro you people probably have issues in the marriage, but you are not divorced. And he's bitter. So he wills the properties to probably his family members and other things. And then he passes on. Um, is there anything you can do about it? There are a lot of things that any party affected by such a situation can, can do. do. Now, the, the operative rule mm. and the practice in Ghana 
it's not so much the party in whose name a property is mm. so much as the fact that whether the property was acquired during the subsistence of the marriage that's one and two whether from the relationship the way they conducted their affairs in terms of acquisition of properties where there was an intention expressly demonstrated through their conduct as to whether each of them want i mean sought to acquire properties in his or her mm. own name as separate mm. from joint property mm. in the instance that you're talking about where possibly there was only one property that was acquired during the course of the marriage and the property was in the name of the man. The woman does not even need so much to lead evidence to demonstrate that she gave money or she whatever mm. gave to the man. The, the, the position of law now is quite clear. That properties that are acquired in the course of the marriage belong to both parties. Unless there's a contrary intention, mm. that must be shown. Mm. As for instance, the evidence that while the man was acquiring the property, the woman was also acquiring property in her own name and stuff like that. But mm. now, the law is pretty clear and pretty certain. And the rule is now, I mean, on the basis of equity. In other words, what is the contribution that the court can find during the subsistence of the marriage as to the relative contributions that each party made to the acquisition of the property? That is the operative rule now. Whatever the position of law I mean, was previously it was substantial contribution and so forth and so on. Now, as a rule, properties acquired in the course of the marriage, irrespective of whoever's name the property is kept, because it has been the tradition and the custom of this country that properties are typically put in the name of the man mm. and whether the woman made a contribution or not. But even now, if we have a property which is in the name of the man, there's a I mean, clear demonstration that the woman possibly did not even make a financial contribution to it. Now, the courts have ways of looking at the marriage relationship, the contribution, not only in terms of money, because we know for a fact that a lot of women in this country make, uh, because they are bearing the children, they are looking after the children. They can only do petty, petty, many women in this country. I mean, that's the way, and the court has now, now taking account of all of that. I mean, because no, it's not just economic contribution that makes a home. So now the courts are looking at all of that as a basis for classifying properties acquired in the course of marriage as joint property. Great. So that's the way it is now. Okay. So that's clarified. Yes. Uh, you can't just get up and be willing. No, 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 no. Willing things. I mean, you can do it, but as to whether it will work, right, it's right. another issue. But we're talking about will. Let me even make this uh, other thing. Now, you know, there is something the law calls reasonable provision. Assuming, for the sake of even our argument, that it was, I mean, quite apart from the issue of joint properties and whatever. Now, a man in particular, you know, I say man, because let me take to you about the, the social reality. Mm. You can't even make a will and leave out, I mean, for instance, your spouse. I mean, leave it out. Even if there's clear evidence that it was your joint property and uh, intended to be so. I mean, I mean, your, your self-acquired property and there was every evidence that intended to be so. The law will now always, it is part of rules of testacy that the court has power to open up a man's will not only a man, I mean, a spouse as well, but because it always applies to men in I practice, know, right? let me talk about <laughs> it. Open up the will and make what we call reasonable provision for no. a spouse and children who are on the left age. Out. That is so. So, I mean, when you make a, there must be good reason. You know, the first rule is that the court never wants to interfere with a person's will, mm. but the law makes provision for what the law calls reasonable provision which can be made out of a man's will for his spouse and children. Mm. Yes. If, yes. Great. So no fears. Eh? No fear, no fear for <laughs> the woman now. <laughs> the lady who said Now the men are not fearing now. Now yeah, men, yeah. men are on a serious threat, you know. So so she th th that particular email, she says that the man has been threatening her, you know, that um, you think you are somebody, right? Don't worry. When eventually I, I, I finish preparing my will and you realize that you have no place <laughs> in it, you know, so. <laughs> Tell the man that you should go and read what we call reasonable provision. But that, the reasonable provision is even, is even an aside. Now, the real issue is that you can't have a, unless there's clear evidence to demonstrate that 
in the course of the marriage, a pattern was established where the woman was working on her own and acquiring things for her own, and the man was also on acquiring his own acquiring things on his own. I mean, because seriously speaking, if I mean there's clear evidence that the woman has acquired this and this in her own name, and the man has also acquired something in his name, then the clear the evidence may be really strong for the court to disturb a man's will or a mm. woman's will Otherwise. for that matter. Otherwise, now it's joint property. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay, someone is asking when you can start sending the names. Like yesterday, send when it you now. can. No, no, no. Uh, the the announcements I made about the honeymoon. Oh, right. You can send it now and just hashtag um, home affairs honeymoon. That's it. So just send it now so that we will be able to fish them out and get back to you. And um, now let me move on. I, we still have questions to ask, but I have some coming in. So let's address some of the specific questions that are audience are asking this one says ask the lawyer if it is possible to convert an ordinance into customer marriage if not what else can i do i think i didn't really give it a deep thought before going into it i have i have been married for almost 20 years now oh wow the, the opposite is true the opposite but the reverse is not very right a customer marriage can always be converted Upgraded into an ordinance marriage. The law, the legal expresses conversion. But an ordinance marriage can, under no circumstance, be converted into, into a, a, a customer, customer marriage. marriage. It's as simple as that. That is so. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, I mean, look, <clears throat> he says that he didn't really give it a deep thought and he's been married for 20 years. For you to be thinking this means that something is going on. Maybe you can you can you can you can let us help with a counselor who may be able to talk you into seeing the beauty in your marriage, other than you know wanting. Yeah, to but do before then, you see, I, I don't know what really is thinking of that makes him think that if he had a customer, maybe he marriage, wants to marry he, another one. Well, apart from that, there's no other advice because everything that I've said applies to customer marriage as well as ordinance marriage, and the, whatever mm -hmm. he's talking about, apart from possibly the desire to marry a second woman. I mean, there could be no other advantage that an ordinance marriage or cannot, I mean, a customer marriage, you cannot get from it like somebody who's married under the ordinance. Okay, yeah. great. Um, listening to Home Affairs, and I just heard about, oh, my honeymoon surprise. Okay, I've told you what you can do, right? So send your name and the name of the person getting married and hashtag Home Affairs Honeymoon, and then we will fish it out, and then we will call you, and hopefully the person you're nominating gets to go to Lou Moon. I'll be telling you a bit about Lou Moon to even what your appetite um, the more. Okay. Lea Pinto, now let me ask this. How do I take custody of my kids in a divorce situation? I know that's a very broad one. You're right. No, it's not how you, but because it is part, you see, the thing about a divorce or divorce proceedings is Or let me ask this, first of all. Who is eligible to have custody of the children in any divorce situation? Either party. Okay. But... But there will be considerations, right? Naturally. Okay. The consideration normally, I mean, when we talk about child, we're talking about child. And especially when they up to teenage years... Mm -hmm. The pattern has always been that the court would favor a woman's request for custody over that of a man unless there's clear evidence of the woman's, I don't know, irresponsibility or something like that. But the pattern, the clear pattern is that the court would normally grant custody of children to the wife with visitation rights to the man okay but there have been few situations where the court you ever have the the, the that dr beckley you mm -hmm. remember dr yes, beckley yes, that, do. that dr beckley yeah. his case beckley versus beckley it's a reported case and in that case it was one of the exceptions because mm -hmm. it appeared the woman had become a woman of the night and the man went to court on the basis of that allegation that by reason of the woman's uh, whatever new occupation, she could not have time for the children, <laughs> and uh, that was the main basis 
or uh, upon which the court granted the custody of the children to the man. Mm. Uh -huh. But typically, custody will always go to a woman. And for a man to be able to establish a case for custody to be given to him, he must demonstrate that on the, under, uh, under the Ghanaian court, within the Ghanaian court, the woman is not Capable your typical woman. woman. That's it. But you know, there are custody is a very funny thing. You know, it's not only the parents that can have custody. Mm. Sometimes, because the primary concern for custody is the welfare of the, of children, the children, not the parents. Yeah. The welfare. And therefore, it sometimes happens that even though people, I mean, a couple have got a child, the child may be living with somebody else for all these number of years. Maybe the child, uh, the, either parents, parents, I mean, that I'm talking about their grandparents and stuff like that. And if the court has got reason to see or know that removing the children from a particular environment, don't forget that where they live, they go to school, they form association, they've got all kinds of, I mean, relationships and stuff like that. If the court has got reason to know that removing them from that environment may affect them one way or the other, the court will maintain that environment and custody will not necessarily go to the parents by mere reason that they are parents. The court may end up granting a divorce, making an order for custody for the children to be kept in the environment where, where they, they have been for the past maybe two, three, four years preceding the marriage because that's where the court finds they are comfortable, they are well rested and stuff like that. So okay. custody is not just about parents. Parenting. It's about whoever has custody of them. At the time of the marriage, the court will look at how, how long they've been there, how well they've been taken care that of is so. and their well-being. That is so. Okay. So that's the primary concern about custody. It's not about the parents, it's about the children and their welfare. Can the children decide where they want to be or who they want to be with? In most custody battles, sometimes the courts take the view of the children oh, in camera. Well. They talk the courts. Don't forget that in this custody battles, the court normally says the social welfare, I mean the social welfare department, the courts work together with them in these kind of things, and they have got the signs of making a determination as to where the child's best place would be. So they, sometimes it involves taking the children I mean, camera, speaking to examining mm -hmm. them. I, I've never been involved in any litigation where the social welfare had to come in in this kind of time. I wouldn't even know the questions that they ask them, but I believe since it's their, I mean, area of expertise, they know what kind of answers that children give to them that will signify or signal some danger or some comfortability and stuff like that. Okay. But there's a science for dealing with that aspect of that matter. Yes. Lawyer Pintle, from your experience, have you mm -hmm. ever, I mean, been in a situation or seen one um, where a total injunction is placed on one of the parents not to visit the children <laughs> or not to see them? <laughs> I know such cases, though. Your question puts it, what is my own experience? Like, I was having the kid. I said, it's no. But I know of that. such cases. If I write, because some what, what would have been the reason? No, you know, some people. I was going to say some men, but I, I'm checking myself. People. Of, of, uh, of ungovernable temper. Mm. Ungovernable. Some people are very terrible. Like, mm. for instance, if there has been a record of you know, some people, they don't even have to be their child. They will beat know, you right? and take your skin off your body. I know. And such people are a danger to themselves. And the threats that they make when they make all of these kind of things, and sometimes it's, you know, the true problem about Ghana is that the social welfare system is not really the best. I'm talking about custody. You know, sometimes the elsewhere, children even have to be taken from a particular environment totally and completely and so forth and so on. But to answer your question, I've known of a, a few instances where parents or either parent is banned completely from mm. relating to a child in any particular because why did they make threats? And if you joke with their threats, by the next time you'll be picking a dead body. That's true. You right. So the social welfare system it's quite robust, but it's not very effective because here yeah, the what supports the system itself is most often not available. Okay. Because yes, so I have a final question on this one before we move on. So, 
custody issues, like you rightly use the, the adjective, is usually a battle. Yeah. But if I am learning from you and hearing you right, you also did mention that in this part of our world, usually um, from childhood till about the teenagers, usually custody is given to the woman. Yes. Now, there are cases or there are instances where the woman is very eligible to take care of the children and make sure that the children are well, their, their well-being is very much considered. You look at the man too, yes, he also is able. So what usually brings about the battle? Why can't the children be with their mother and, you know, care is taking, I mean, they're taking good care of their father visits and you have a relationship? Or why can't they just simply be with daddy and then mommy can visit and then you have it? Why is there always a battle? Like, I just want to understand from you because you have handled cases, you have been in these situations. What usually brings about a battle? Not in cases where maybe we can tell that one of the parents is not eligible. But in this case, they are both eligible. So why are they fighting? I'll tell you that when you get into our course, I'll tell you marvel at how the judges use their discretion and judgment and stuff like that. But it's got more of a social problem than a legal issue. You know, mm. when people are going through divorce, mm. I mean, I mean, like you said, you know, I've sat in court and I've always asked and I've wondered whether indeed either parent thinks that if the child gets to the other, that one will wake <laughs> up in the night, pick a knife and kill the child. I so just that, understand. So, I mean, it's, it's totally unbelievable when you find yourself in court and I think it's got more to do with the social problem of mm. the parent because don't forget that mm. they are going through themselves a crisis of a sort which nobody really recognizes. And then everybody tries to make the excuse to paint the other, the real devil that the person is or is not and so forth and so on and how the judges eventually make a decision i mean i've always marveled i'll tell you very honestly i mean because i've been in court and seen parties and the way they want to paint the other if they really are the pictures that they paint then they will not even be able to fit into the court but i mean it's a good question that you ask and i'll tell you that's a social issue it's got more social issue. And you know, here, I'm sorry, even though we've got all the experts and we're psychological mm. and social and so forth and so on, I, I think that the game is played by each parent trying to pin the other, the real devil that the person is or ought to be, and that if the child was left in the custody of the other. But as a rule, in the current situation I described, Courts will hesitate always to give children, mm -hmm. especially females, even to their fathers because of this new phenomenon of abuse and there's no distinction now between, I mean, even parents, I mean, their own fathers and stuff like that. So the courts have always concluded that it is safer. I mean, if they have to make a, a, a bet, it is safer to leave the children with the mothers. And like I said, the woman really has to be irresponsible, really irresponsible with clear evidence. But the difficulty I myself sometimes come across is neither parent is ready to live with a child. They want to ah. take the child and, and give, to give it to their somebody. <laughs> that, that kind of thing. That That is where the problem really arises. Because the woman by reason of her whatever position and stuff, she herself cannot have the time. time. And then she wants the children only to give to her parents. And the man also begins to make the same argument. It's not ah, as ah, a good ah, parent ah, as ah, you ah, are. Ah, ah, but ah, interestingly, ah, ah, the court ah, will ah, always come to some form of conclusion. Like I said, according to the law, taking the best case, I mean the best interest of the child, I mean, into, into consideration. consideration. That's always. And that will always depend on the facts and the evidence that are made available to the court. And typically, the court will make the social welfare department mm -hmm. do some background checks and stuff like that and present reports to the court on the basis mm -hmm. of which the court mm -hmm. to make that decision. Great. Yes. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's very interesting when you hear some of these things. And yes, the bit about the fact that it's not like they want to keep their children. That is all. You know, sometimes too, I, I, I think it's, 
I, or I don't know if you, you know about that, that sometimes there's the fear of you're going to be with another person and I am not sure how they will treat my child. Right. You know, and all right, right. All that's those a social, are part of the social, social reality. issues. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, there's a question here. Um, I'll ask you, but I will come back to take the answer. It says we are married. My husband acquired a property and has warned me not to step a foot um, into that property. He said it's his family property. He's given it to his mother, and I am not part of their family. He said he will not work on any property with me. What will the law say about that? Lawyer Pencil, I'll come back in a little while to take um, your answers on that. You are still tuned into Home Affairs right here on Joy 99.7 FM. We are discussing your marriage and the law. Very interesting lessons we're picking right here in the studio with lawyer Kwekuyamwa Pencil. Now, the rich taste of Dano milk makes a perfect combination for your tea, your oat, your gari sokens, your cocoa, and all the others. And it gives you that great taste you've always desired. Dano milk is rich. And a very rich source of natural protein and fortified with vitamin A. It has several other vitamins and essential nutrients that keeps you nourished and healthy every day. Dano milk is also rich in proteins, iodines, vitamin B12, calcium. And... Um, milk is natural it comes in different variants talk about the dano milk cool cow or plain powdered milk dano milk coffee three in one dano milk chocolates three in one and dano evaporated milk dano milk is affordable and in a shop near you choose a tasty milk choose nourishment choose dano milk dano milk go for it and are you ready for a blast of your lifetime get ready to be part of the newest and ultimate game show on joy prime this april family arena is fun cheeky diverse and hilarious and it will blow your mind join the train and win cash and amazing prizes to participate send your family name and first names um, of your team members to our WhatsApp number 055157577. Number again is 055157577 for details. Family Arena coming soon on Joy Prime, your ultimate TV experience. <laughs> The joy of every parent is to see their children cheerful and hearty. To achieve this desire, every parent needs to ensure that their children are given nutritious foods that has the essential nutrients and multivitamins which can promote their welfare. One of such nutritious beverages is Vitamilk Soy Milk Drink. Vitamilk Soy Milk is made from natural soybeans, which is a good source of plant protein, vitamin B1 and B2. Vitamilk has no artificial coloring, no artificial flavorings, and no preservatives. And for over 20 years in Ghana, Vitamilk Soy Milk has been consistent with its product quality, sumptuous taste, and its vital nutritional benefit. So go and choose Vitamilk Chum for your children because it has plant protein and it is nutritiously 
uh, amazing and also very satisfying. Vitamilk also comes in its regular soy milk drink, Vitamilk Energy, the, the multi cereal with no caffeine. You can have it in Vitamilk Choco, Vitamilk Banana, Vitamilk Strawberry, and it also comes in the 250 ml and the one. One liter tetra pack. Vita milk is indeed a nutritious beverage that feels good anywhere, anytime. Once again, thank you very much for staying tuned right here. We're studying a lot on the show this morning, your marriage and the law. Earlier on, I announced that we have our honeymoon packages for the next four weeks coming up. And so every week we are selecting one person who gets to win, you know, an all expense paid weekend stay or honeymoon you know it's not just an ordinary weekend stay it's a honeymoon and you know honeymoons come with lots of things and this is actually going to be on the moon at Lumoon. moon and so you can send if you have a you know a loved one who is getting married next week saturday you want to send their details to us we need your number most importantly and send it to zero five five one 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 nine nine seven and uh, we will call you if you happen to be the winner we will call you and we'll go through all the details with you until these people um go to Lu moon i will be telling you a bit about Lu moon so you know where they are going and how exciting it will be for them just hashtag it honeymoon on home affairs and then we will get back to you Lea pencil i asked a question earlier um, now says that her husband, they've been married for a bit. Her husband has acquired some property and has warned her never to go near the property. He says it's his family property and that he has given it to his mother. And he, she is not part of their family, so she can't go close to the property. And he has also said that he is not going to work on any joint property with her. What will the law say about her situation? question put me in thought and first is the, the what the legal position and two is what she can do practically about it the first part of it is as a matter of law based on what I already said this property is joint property and it is only the equities that will determine whether she is 50% joint owner 40 percent 30 percent but now the law is clearly settled that property that is acquired in the course of a marriage belongs to both property that's the presumption but like i'm saying evidence if all that i take is what is here the woman is a joint owner of that property is the equities the clear evidence that will come as her contribution and stuff like that that will determine whether in this is 50% co-owner. And therefore, what it means is that the husband does not have the power. And if he has the power or he has exercised that power, that power will be exercised subject to the law. In other words, the woman will be deemed to be a co-owner of that property, meaning that what he has done is certainly wrong. And the court will not hesitate if any action has to come before it for the court to make that declaration. The real issue is, what are the options, the practical options that are open to this woman? Mm -hmm. In other words, if she can count her chances, then obviously she can look on, and since the men always die before, the woman... <laughs> <laughs> like a pencil, that's I'm, sort of it. I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at the practical effect of seeking to exercise her right during the cause of the relationship because you know a lot of these things it can only be brought consequent upon the dissolution of a marriage you know that is the funny thing about the law as it stands now because while the man is alive i mean i wouldn't know in what circumstance are you going to court to ask the court to declare you joint owner and stuff like that so but it's the man who must be listening now that if i mean the first place he cannot claim that the woman is not co-owner of the property. The law has changed, and it's about time that men understood 
And even if people do these things and they hide it in the name of their parents and so forth and so on, before a court of law and a court of equity, it's not going to work. It's as simple as that. But that's a different ball game altogether from the practical effect, or rather the practical steps that the woman can take to have that kind of declaration made a court of law. Because this would certainly cannot happen in the course of, if I may put it in quote, a healthy, I mean, marriage relationship. Mm. And that's the, that's the catch in all of these situations. But the man ought to know that if the woman of God dies before him, he can have a safe distance. But if any time, my problem is that if you're not careful, you're going to end your marriage on such issues. Mm. I mean, that, that's the real problem. And unfortunately, the way our law is couched now makes these reliefs only as part of a divorce, uh, what do you call it, matter in court. Mm. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the difficulty about the state of the law now. So the woman is in a catch, whatever situation. But the law is what I've pronounced, which is that by law, she's a co-owner of, of that property. property. All right. How she realizes that dream in her lifetime is another matter. <laughs> oh, dear. Lawyer <laughs> Faisal. Okay. We have another... Um, uh, okay. This one says that... Okay. My brother-in-law is divorced. They have an eight-year-old son who the woman has custody of. The boy is in the same school as my son. The boy comes to school by the bus. But every time there is a public holiday, the boy wants to live with her auntie, which is my wife. Could the father have asked for custody for her sister? Uh, my wife drives, uh, drives to drop and pick um, my son daily. My wife sometimes has to hide because he sometimes joins her home and will have to take him in the evening. Do, do you get it? I'm wondering what the question is about. So the but question is that uh -huh. um, this mm -hmm. man says that his brother-in-law is divorced. And yes. they have an eight-year-old son. And yeah. his wife has custody of the son. That's his ex-wife. That is so. Now, they are in the same school with this man's child. That is so. Now, um, the boy comes to school by bus. However, every time there is a holiday mm -hmm. or there is no school, yeah. the boy wants to live with his auntie, which is this person sending That's the messages. So. so the question is that, could the man have asked for custody for the sister? Oh, that the auntie that this boy loves to be with all the time? <laughs> On occasions. You know, you can, I mean, what court makes orders, I mean, they are not cast in stone. Those orders can always be varied. And therefore, if for instance, but from what the way the way, the way it has been worded, it does not appear to me that there's, there's a, a problem. problem yet. Yeah, you know I what I'm see saying. It. There's but no if it was, then they can ask the court to vary the order to make it possible for the boy to visit the auntie yeah. or the uncle's wife. It just seems like he has a favorite auntie. That and is if, so. And if ever there is the opportunity to yeah. be with that auntie, that is he so. would want to be with yeah, that auntie. Yeah, because so as he puts it like now, there's, there's no, no issue. There's no problem. I you get it right. too. There's yeah. no issue. There's no issue. Yeah. Now, so, Lawyer Pencil, in a divorce situation, who is entitled to an alimony? To alimony? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good question you ask. Alimony, uh -huh. pendant litty, that is pending <laughs> the litigation and final, uh, what do you call Lawyer it? Lawyer Pencil, why are you so excited about this <laughs> I'm one? excited because that always goes to the woman. You <laughs> hardly hear of it. No, there have been a few instances where the man got alimony at the, this. Uh, I, it, it, it puts me <laughs> to laughter because there was ever a case where the parties for that shall remain nameless. Mm -hmm. But the man was a professor in the university. The wife was with a bank and was making a lot of money, far more money. But, you know, it's kind of, I mean, a, an automatic thing that the woman will always put in an application for alimony. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And in this case, the woman did that. So when you, when you, when as part of the alimony pending litigation or whatever, the court will ask the parties to file what we call an affidavit of means. Affidavit of means essentially an affidavit in which the party is required to make a full disclosure as your sources of income, how you spend your money, or rather the expenditure that you make over a period. The idea is for the court to find on the evidence what kind of money is available to either party 
And because no court can make an order for alimony of any kind without knowing the parties' means of income sources and stuff like that. So we had this kind of case where, obviously, the man being a university lecturer, you, you can just tell from his slave, whatever. Then the lady was working with the bank. So we then applied for alimony. For the man. For the woman. Okay. We work for the man. And, you know, funnily enough, the woman was, I mean, because the man was my friend before we took out the matter, so I gave it to another colleague in the firm. So I wanted to present myself as not being involved with their divorce matter. So the woman called me and said, that my friend, what is in his head? <laughs> because the man was asking for her <laughs> to support him. To do it. The woman said to me, what is wrong with my friend? I said, you... That they hit you now, you saying because on the evidence, the woman was working in a bank, well paid. I had saw us about three times that of her husband, and she had rather put and her application. You that, you that he's asking, the woman is asking, he doesn't know that you are part of the firm. of course. And they really gave it to and the they asking, I was a good friend to both of them, and that's the only oh, reason why yeah. I could not rear my head directly. But in the eventually, in the long run, she abandoned her application. Of course, the man was also no pushing, really. But I'm just trying to make the point that in a so proposal. So was granted or nobody? No, eventually, the woman, she didn't push her application. She, mm -hmm. she didn't push with it. Okay. So the court did not have to make a determination. But that okay. was a clear case. If we really, the man wanted to be mean, I would use mean. Because prior to that, the man was living on his own. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But then if you say you want alimony pending litigation or whatever, then you need to. I mean, quite clearly, how can you get a man to make a this merely because you were a wife when you were earning about three times more than him? Mm. You work with a financial institution, and obviously. So, the first point I want to make is that alimony is founded on need. Okay. Support. So it's not just that because you're divorced. No, you no, 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 no. You must de demonstrate that because I have these three or four number of children, I have to look at. You, you, I mean, the, typically, the custody is with the woman. Typically, the custody is with the woman. And, of course, once the, the relationship gets into that burn, then what it means is that the man also don't feel like, I mean, supporting you or bringing you whatever. I don't know why we always go through that kind of burn. But because, oh, I'm sorry, but this is a social reality that in Ghana, a lot of men believe that, the woman, I, I don't know, but the men are not willing to assist half of them. That I, I, with due respect, I'm sorry, but I need to put it that in this country, men are more irresponsible mm. when it comes to the maintenance, welfare, and whatever of their children. There are many, many men who are having children without regard. I mean, them, they just walk off. And the women are compelled in all kinds of situations. And it even eats into high society. I'm mm. talking about educated men, educated mm. women. Mm. And the men have the children. And once they go through this patch, they think that they don't owe the wife Anything. any responsibility and stuff like that. Other than that, there will be no need at all for even these things to come to court. But mm. being as, it, as they are, when they come to court, the court has to find a basis. And, and like I'm saying, I'm a legal basis for justification for whatever it is they make. So simply, it's based on need, which must be established on the evidence that this number of children, this one goes to this school, this one goes to this school, this one goes, these are the fees. On the average, every man has spent so much on these children and so forth and so on. And having regard to ABC, sometimes even rent, all of them, they are factored. And then the court wants to look at the means of the parties and determine the contribution that each party must bring for the period that the matter is in court. That's what we call alimony pendant litigation. That is a pending litigation. Then when at the end of the suit, the court has to make absolute, I mean the orders that it has already made. So the court will then make an order, for instance, to say from now up to this period, every man, let the man take care of the accommodation, which is 2,000 cities per month. Let the, when it comes, because once the primary caregiver, the one who is living with the children, would always make all kinds of expenses that cannot even properly be factored. Yeah. So typically, the school fees, their feeding, accommodation, these are the three principal things that any judge must have to have a look at. And depending on the means of the woman, the court may make an order for contribution from the woman. But the main thing would be on the man. 
What if there were no children in the marriage? Well, if there are no children, the others will be made according to the circumstances of the people. Because like uh, the example that I gave to you, you were working in a bank, you were earning so much money. The man is a poor university lecturer, living with the mom and living with whatever, <laughs> and you still want him to make contributions towards the come No legal basis. The, oh, alimony is not intended to pacify the whims of people, it's to mm. fulfill a social need mm. that can be established in a court of law. Okay. That's the way it is. Great. Yes. Someone sent a message, until the declaration of divorce, I think that it is also criminal to see another person, and that will amount to bigamy. This is from lawyer Berima Asiyu Dulabi. Well, it's a social reality. People do it. I mean, I'm not even concerned about the criminal element and the, the <laughs> how we appear before God. You know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> Someone is giving you funds. Lawyer Pencil, God bless you for saying the painful truth of men. Adam, great, insightful, and educational discussion. Have a blessed weekend. This is from Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a bit about the irresponsibility of, of you know, some of the men. Um, okay. So we will activate our phone lines on 0302216541. 0221-6541. But that will be right after this break. It's a perfect opportunity this Ramadan Karim to make it an extra special season for your family and friends with Melcom. With affordable products ranging from groceries, electronics, homeware, kitchenware, furniture and more, you've got all your needs sorted. Ramadan Mubarak to our Muslim family. Terms and conditions apply. Melcom. We're gonna shops. Dive into a new era of news consumption with myjoyonline.com, your go to destination for cutting edge journalism, giving you the most credible stories from business to politics and from sports to entertainment. Myjoyonline.com introduces an upgraded news website meticulously designed to empower you with an enriched browsing experience like never before. Experience the future of news browsing with myjoyonline.com. Introducing Pick 4 from Game Park Games, the easiest lottery to play and win. Pick 4 numbers from 0 to 9, up to 3 times a day to become one of our daily winners. More mula, more power. Play online at www.gameparkgames.com or dial star 946 hash to play. Game Park Games is regulated by the National Lottery Authority, not for persons under 18. Play responsible. Pick 4 from Game Park Games. More mula, more power. Thank you all so very much for being a part of our show this morning. We have a few minutes to wrap up and then we will hand over to the Weekend City Show team at Elmina. That's where the show will be coming to you from this morning. So Ruben, Langabel, Kofi Hayford, they are all chilling out there. there with a the team from the insurance commission but like pencil um ahead of the phone calls there's a question you know someone sent me a question and says that hey mm, asked them all um so he realized that three children he has with his wife he's taking care of them to their teenagers only to be realizing somehow that the children are not his all the three and he has done, you know, they've done DNA and everything. The kids are not his. His, his head. Now, the story behind that, as he shares, is that, yes, it's true. Um, he, I think, for some reason, he's unable to have kids, but he didn't know. Um, I don't know how his wife got to know, but the woman also said there was so much pressure on her, you know. 
So she had to go out and bring the children. And so three children, teenagers, they are all not his. He is asking, can he sue his wife for deceit? Sue his wife for deceit. In law, yes. He, he would want to keep the children and take care of them, but he wants to sue the woman. I will advise him. The question, the answer to his question is that yes. And obviously, it will be within the context of a divorce mm-hmm. proceedings. Because essentially, the woman has cheated and cheated terribly on him. But then, but I'm he's not brought only... You, he's, she says she's brought him honor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't only sit here <laughs> as a lawyer. As you said, I'm also... I know a, a, a man of God, and, and like a family ask life him, counselor. I'm ask him to, 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 to take it as it is. Ace. And forgive the wife. I'll ask him to do it. Men do all kinds of things. You know, it's amazing the way men don't think there is something called forgiveness. Men do it, and they ask the woman to forget it. But I'm asking him to forgive her. And I do so as a man of God. I don't only sit there as a lawyer. And I know what I'm saying is not so easy to put it. Mm-hmm. But all things are possible. Now that he's got these three children and he can legitimately own them mm-hmm. as they are. And that would be it. But there was the point about taking the woman to court and all of that. You'd be embarrassing even the children. But if it's is he able to? We want to look at the legal aspect of it. No, no, he is within the context of a divorce. Within the context of a divorce, then he will seek a divorce. And of course, I mean, if I may put in the eyes of the world, embarrass her, disgrace Why, her. you can't sue somebody you are still married to? Well, the, the, the real <laughs> difficulty. Mm. The real difficulty. Because, you see, the logical consequence mm-hmm. of any such action will be that he will give up the children also. Okay. Because you cannot claim a whole day. You see, the, the, the funny thing about a marriage mm-hmm. is that everything is presumed to be right and okay unless mm-hmm. the contrary evidence shows. So, for instance, these children, the evidence that is God that they are not his children, nobody has come to claim the children as their own. And therefore, presumably, he can hold on to them as his own children. That's the presumption that the law makes in his favor. And even though now he's got the evidence that shows that these children are not his own, he can live with them as his children. Unless an issue arises where somebody comes up to say that this child, don't forget that they are three, and as you say, they may not even belong to one man. Mm. They may not. So I would rather advise him to keep that information to himself make the best amends that he can make with his wife. Continue to live with her as normal. And that will be it. That's my own advice. It doesn't mean that as a matter of law, he can disown the children. He can, dis- I mean, because the evidence of uh, the woman having committed adultery and whatever is quite clear by the distance. And no court of law can compel a man to keep the marriage in the light of all this information. But let me tell you what, a divorce is not only going to be granted because after how many years you now recognize. If you say the marriage broke it up beyond reconciliation by reason of what the evidence that you've got. But no law, no court will also compare to divorce or what merely on that. Because even where there's clear evidence of this mm-hmm. adultery and so forth and so on, there are clear limitations in context where you can seek a divorce based on evidence of adultery. You that after discovery of that fact, you have not gone into the woman. After the discovery of the fact of the adultery, within a certain time you must not. Up to the time that you go to court, you must not have gone back to the woman and slept with her. But please, I will tell him that I don't sit there as a lawyer. Every day we counsel all manner of people, even as a matter of law, he can have the children as legitimate children, he can have the wife as his legitimate wife, and that will be it. That's the road that I play with this cup that I'm wearing this morning. Marriage. Look <laughs> before you leap. <laughs> however, you look, however you look, there's no guarantee. I can hey. tell you. No, you can't look at the face of a man or I woman. I know, uh, but I mean, it's... it's, it's uh, 
Hmm. You know, I think that look as human beings, we just complicate things for we ourselves. Do. Yeah, we complicate things for ourselves. We do. You can look at the face of a man or a woman and make any determination. The real issue is when we are confronted with the fact, when we are confronted with the issues, what you can, and then it can be charitable. We complicate things for we ourselves do. because we do. Um, nobody said it's easy. You know. Especially people in America and whatever, when they want to come home for their children. I've known a very old story. From when I take five children to America Embassy, they say, oh. number one, number three, mm -hmm. number five, and I'm not children. your children. I mean, that's the way it goes. And I have come across people who, in spite of that, still wanted to continue with the process of sending the children out. Except that under American rules and regulations, you cannot own them. I mean, you cannot at that point say present your children. It's another procedure. I've, I've come across people who, nonetheless, notwithstanding, still have want still, to have yeah, because you say you are related to someone that's your child. The part is the, the relationship, mm -hmm. and it's so deep. And you're not going to get up one day and with the that. knowledge that this child, beginning to hate that child, you must be the devil yourself. Yes, but like I painted, we won't also discount the fact that this could be very traumatizing oh man, I for know whoever it. i know it and could break i mean I it know, could be I, I've, I i have a I, ha, I have experienced the situation with somebody and the person's life has never been the same I he know. just feels like he's he's unworthy you know, know and and he's been played for a fool all these years yeah. how do i even come out of it so i i pretty much understand what you're saying yeah. but that's not to also discount the fact that it's so easy to just get up and say okay, no it's not i'm yeah, not pretending yeah. i'm not yeah. pretending that maybe if it happened to me I may, be you, may, <laughs> uh, you, may you, you may not be able to drink your own medicine. You know what I'm saying. All right. You're right. Great. But, you know, God gives us strength to be able to overcome all things, especially if we are putting um, all our, casting our burdens on him. But we're wrapping up on Home Affairs this morning. I do hope that you have learned a bit. I have. Marriage is no child's play. It's no game. <laughs> Marriage can turn your life around 360. <laughs> In fact, 720. <laughs> <laughs> or you can keep spinning and spinning and spinning and it will never end. <laughs> My God grants us grace. Before we go... Let me remind you again that the joy of every parent is to see their children cheerful and hearty. To achieve this desire, every parent needs to ensure that their children are given nutritious food that has the essential nutrients and multivitamins which can promote their welfare. One such nutritious beverage is Vitamilk Soy Milk Drink. Vitamilk Soy Milk Drink is made from natural soybeans, which is a good source of plant protein, vitamin B1 and B2. Vitamilk has no artificial coloring, no artificial flavorings and no preservatives um so go on and choose vitamin champ for your children because it has plant proteins and it is nutritious amazingly delicious and satisfying Vitamilk also comes in its regular soy milk drink. Um, you have the Vitamilk Energy and the multi cereal with no caffeine. Vitamilk Chi Choco. Vitamilk Banana Strawberry. You can have it in the 250 mils and one liter Tetra Pak. Vitamilk is indeed a nutritious beverage that feels good anywhere, anytime. And Pentecost Hour, a religious broadcast program sponsored by the Church of Pentecost, comes your way with the chairman of the Church of Pentecost, Apostle Eric Nyamiche. Every Sunday at 1.30 on Joy FM, Hits FM, every Monday at 5.30 a.m. and on Joy Prime Saturdays at 7 a.m. Tune in every Saturday, Monday, and Saturday as Apostle Nyamicha brings you life-transforming truth that nourishes the soul, ignites passion, and restores hope to the nations. The Church of Pentecost, we are possessing the nations for the Lord. Thank you all so very much for doing the listening on Home Affairs this morning. Thank you all very much for doing the listening. My name is Adam Knightstay. This is where we are wrapping up on our show this morning. Daniela Jojo, 
Um, Clement, thank you very much. Lawyer Pencil. Hi. Yami Show, Bibri. You're welcome. Yeah, that's Bibri. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great. You're and we're handing over to the team uh, Weekend City Show in Cape Coast. See you next week and enjoy your weekend. This week, make sure you stay tuned into um, Joy Prime. We have amazing family content for you right from this morning throughout the whole day. And if you are, you know, that fun-loving, funky person who loves to listen to music and you want to always keep feeling young at heart, then I recommend our sister station, Hits FM, for you. But right here on Joy 99.7 FM, we have Weekend City Show, right after which we have News File, and then we will follow it with Sports Link, and then Showbiz A to Z will come your way. After Showbiz A to Z, we have News Flash with Uncle Paul, and then a DJ Black will come in with the open house party. Your Saturday is covered on the Joy Brand. Hello, Ahima.